Uh, so I'm here today to talk about, uh, give you an introduction on AngularJS. How many people use AngularJS? So this is probably going to be boring because it's a very intro to Angular. So hopefully maybe you learn a little tidbit, something new or something like that. Uh, my name is Joshua Woodward. I'm an engineer here at eBay. Um, I also organize a Google Developer Group. Does everybody know what a GDG is? Yes. Okay. So I uh, organized one in Fresno um, about four years ago. I started one, and then I got the job here at eBay, and now I live up here and organize on like a global level more, uh, helping out with all the other organizers and stuff like that. Uh, so AngularJS is a JavaScript framework created at Google uh, on like an AdSense team or DoubleClick, uh, one of those two teams internally. Um, it was uh, created by Misco. Does everybody know who Misco is? So you guys all pretty much know what Angular is then, right? <laughs> so this is going to probably be a little bit boring for you then, maybe. Let's see here. OK, this is the logo. <laughs> everybody knows what the logo looks like? OK, so I think. Uh, their, their motto is like a super heroic JavaScript framework, and they probably got the idea for the logo off of like something like Superman or something, like a shield or something, right? Um, I like to think uh, differently sometimes. Uh, I'm not that good at Photoshop, but if I could create the logo, it would be like this. Uh, and I would come up with a totally new slogan that it's like a badass mother effing framework, and that would be my inspiration. <laughs> So if you've ever used Angular, you know that it's like better than anything else out there. OK, so AngularJS uh, really doesn't do anything new. It just combines a bunch of great ideas into like one framework. Uh, templating has been around for a long time. Uh, Angular makes the templates on the client side, uh, which is real nice. So if you're familiar with um, server-side templating like Django or something like that, then you'll, you'll uh, you know what I'm talking about. Let's see here. Um, it also uses a model view control pattern. So you have models, and you have views, and you have controllers. So some people like to argue that it's like a model view, view model, model view, view whatever. I say that it's a model view controller because there's con the word controller right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So another concept is uh, data, bi data binding. Uh, again, not a new concept, but they bring it into uh, JavaScript pretty nicely. Um, you can see here in this uh, controller, um, I have a model uh, called user with a property called name that's blank. Um, I also have a uh, function tied to a directive, which I'll get, I'll describe better uh, later, uh, that basically acts kind of similar to the onClick function in JavaScript, except that it's not in the global scope, <coughs> right? So that's why it's uh, okay to put on your, directly on your element. Um, and so all this does is call this function, which then does an alert, right? <coughs> so what's the cool part is uh, the, da the data binding part. So you have another directive called ng-model, which then binds um, this input box to your model. Does that make sense? Uh, where user.name comes from, right? So if I type in this input box without any other uh, JavaScript, this is actually all the code that's running on this slide. Without any extra JavaScript, it changed that variable, which gets alerted here. So that's one concept of data binding. Uh, the other one is also uh, updating your view as you uh, type. So the two-way data binding instantly updating your view 
It's the same concept, except I don't have a function this time. I'm actually uh, binding to the view. So here's my model. And uh, same thing, as I type, the view will get updated, though. So if you ever tried to do something like that in jQuery, you'd have to do a lot of watching and on event listening and update uh, this element and stuff. And so Angular does that all for you in the, uh, um, in the framework. Went too far here. OK, so uh, another concept now is uh, three-way data binding. I don't have a slide for it, but if, uh, is anybody familiar with Firebase? Firebase, OK. So Firebase is like a persistent data store, uh, like a NoSQL data store. Um, and with like two or three lines of code in your Angular and including their library, you can have now three-way data binding, which basically you update your model, which updates your view, which also updates your database, like all instantly, right? Let me see, I actually have, let's see. Okay, so using Firebase uh, and some uh, Canvas and stuff like that, let me also pull up a different browser so that you can see that they're in two different windows here. Okay, so basically all this is is an HTML5 canvas. I cut up an image and move the pieces around. Um, and I have, and it's all written in Angular. Um, and basically all I have is like X, Y coordinates of every little puzzle piece. Uh, so when you move them, if we move them uh, just as one view, uh, my Angular uh, model is getting updated with X, Y, X, Y, X, Y's, right? But you throw in Firebase on top of that and um, update your database, which then turns around and automatically sends a signal to all the other subscribers, and they get the new X, Y coordinate too. So it's pretty cool. Except, there we go. So if anybody else uh, went to this URL, you could move these puzzle pieces around and it'd be in real time. And basically all it's doing is sending X, Y coordinates back and forth messaging. Yep, let's see, that wasn't me. No hands. <laughs> there is a bug that if two people try to move at the same time, I gotta fix that. But yeah. So that's a concept of three-way data binding. Uh, another concept uh, that they bring is uh, dependency injection. So uh, to help out with scopes and stuff like that, you can, you can create your own services. They have a lot of built-in services. Uh, scope is one of them. HTTP is another one. And you just inject those into your function, uh, your controller function. Um, and you have complete access to all these pre-built services, and you can build your own services as well. Um, okay, so a little bit more about directives. Um, one of the built-in directives is ng-repeat. Basically, all it does is take your uh, HTML element and duplicate it. So in this instance, uh, ng-repeat is taking this list item and repeating it for every item. It creates a new sc local scope variable called item for every element in that array. So item at this point is zero, at this point is one, at this point is two. So it makes it real easy to iterate over lists and copy DOM elements over and over. You have to watch out. Uh, so we use, or I use Angular, uh, here at eBay, and uh, I work on a tools team uh, where we monitor the systems and stuff. So sometimes we'll have like 200,000 records, and you'll bog down your your browser if you if you're trying to repeat over 200,000 records. So you got to learn some techniques. So that's the quick introduction. Uh, this is a 
an older slide, but uh, use uh, the uh, the CDN for the library if you're uh, if you're including Angular in your project and it's not like a like a major thing that you have to have the library locally. So like eBay.com would host their own version, obviously. But um, if you're if you're doing this, um, it's hosted on Google, so. I'm pretty sure it's going to be there, available. I don't know. They don't go down too often. Uh, you win free cache because the browser caches, caches it, so it'll pull it from cache pretty, in, uh, pretty instantly. If uh, somebody goes to abc.com and they have Angular library and, you, and now your site is xyz.com, they don't really have to download the library anymore. It's in their cache. So that's a, a benefit of using a CDN. OK. So when you first build an Angular app, uh, you tell Angular where your app is going to live. Uh, Angular makes it very easy to make, to, to just add Angular in one little piece of your website. You don't have to make your whole site uh, Angular and like get rid of all your jQuery. And uh, if for some reason, I don't know why you're using Backbone or Ember, uh, you don't have to do that either. Um, and you can do it anywhere in the page. So uh, you can either make your whole HTML document uh, Angular ready, or you can make just a, a small part um, the app. And ng app is another built-in directive that you would uh, that's built into Angular. And it basically tells, hey Angular, this is where I'm at. Yes. Uh, that's a good question. I honestly, yeah, I don't know if, uh, so when Angular first loads, it looks for that. Um, I don't know if it continues to watch the DOM for that. That's a good question. I'm sure there's a way to alert it that you just did. Yeah, there is a, a, like a angular.bootstrap uh, call to bootstrap the app. And that's basically what this directive does. Um, so I mentioned this earlier, uh, people like to call it other things, but as you can see, there's a controller, a model, and a view. That's just repetitive. I like to make the point that it's model view controller. Um, okay, so here's another example of uh, uh, ng-repeat with better data instead of zero, one, two. So let's say you have a model of, uh, of fruit in a basket. Right, so you have an array uh, called basket, and it has all your fruit in it, and you want to repeat over it. It's it it makes it real easy. Uh, this is literally all the code that's going on on this page, uh, minus the uh, inclusion of the libraries and stuff. But all I did was create a controller and repeat over for every fruit in the basket, output the fruit. It makes it super easy to to go over a list of. Uh, a list of users or, or subscribers or items in a shopping cart or anything like that, and you just have this one template and it, and it repeats very easily. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide. It's been a while since I gave this talk and I don't remember what that slide's about. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, another built-in directive is ng-bind. So in Angular, uh, they use the double curly braces, uh, kind of like handlebars, um, to bind uh, your model to the view. Uh, these curly braces are customizable, so you can use whatever you want. And actually, in this presentation, I'm using curly brace bracket curly brace so that it doesn't render those curly braces. Um, but yeah, you can change the curly braces however you want. Um, that ng, those cur double curly braces are virtually the same as the ng bind directive. Um, it's recommended that you use ng bind on a, on like your first load page because if, if for some reason it's slow, your users will see the double curly braces with your variable and this will, this will basically give them a blank element then when Angular bootstraps, it will bind that model to 
that element. So on all your subsequent pages, because Angular's already loaded, use the double curly braces. But if you use ng bind on like your first initial load, you'll prevent that like flash of, if anybody's experienced that, the double curly braces. So usually on an index, on the, like the main page or the index, try and do all ng binds, and then you'll get um, rid of that. Um, another built-in directive, I guess, of Angular is form. So it's not ng form, you just use your standard form tag and Angular will automatically uh, bind to it and uh, do extra stuff for you on it and watch it and do stuff like that. Uh, but another cool thing is uh, um, it also uh, binds to all these other input types. So a lot of stuff you have to, you, you know that it's Angular because it's like ng controller, ng repeat, or something like that. Uh, when it comes to forms, it, Angular's doing a lot of stuff on the forms, but, and you don't have to add those uh, additional directives on it. It automatically handles forms for you. So on an input type checkbox, if you add a model to it, which is, I have checked this out, and I've defaulted it to false, uh, it basically turns this model into a boolean and true false. So as, as you change this, um, you get the angular, um, angular action of, of uh, data binding and updating your view and your model gets updated. Um, and angular really does that on, on the input type checkbox stuff. Uh, so here's another example um, of an uh, input box with some additional functionality. So um, there's a lot of uh, similarity to, the, to JavaScripts, like on mouse enter, on change, on click, and they're renamed to directives like ng click, ng change, and stuff like that. So in this example, I have a tip, uh, tip object with a bill, uh, bill amount. So like, say this is like a, a tip calculator, right? Um, I guess I could have done a to-do app or something as well, but um, what happens here is as this input box changes, it performs this calc tick uh, function, which sets the tip amount to the bill amount times 20% because I usually tip 20%. I don't know about you guys. Uh, so then what it does is use, uh, it binds tip amount about right here and then it'll take the bill and add the tip amount and bind it right here. Uh, what this pipe does is a filter which are built-in filters into Angular. So I can just say filter currency, and it'll automatically format the number for me in currency. So if I enter a bill amount of 2467, you can see as, I'm type, as it changes, the function gets called every time, the math happens, the UI gets updated, and all that, uh, even the number formatting happens autom automatically. So, it's pretty pretty slick. I mean, this is literally all the, this is all the code that's happening, and it and it makes it nice and fancy. Uh, so one way that you can enhance the uh, user experience for that slide is another directive called ng show. So ng show takes a, uh, a truthy value. Uh, it could be a boolean. It could be a, a, an expression that equates to true or false. Uh, it could be a string that's either hasn't been defined yet, that's null, or that has a string in it. So uh, currently tip amount is undefined. So it comes back, that's kind of falsy, right? So therefore it doesn't show that span across the bottom anymore. As soon as I type in a tip amount, um, tip amount becomes tr a truthy value of like whatever tip bill times, 20 per, uh, times 0.2 is, so then it starts to show it, right? 
put in a negative number? You might break it. Let's see. Nope, it works. How about imaginary, yeah. imaginary number? Totally. A, a what number? Imaginary number. String. What's string. a string? Oh, okay. So it's, yeah, that's the school. Let's say this is. <laughs> but that's really a number, so it's. Uh, is there a symbol or? <laughs> so. Well, there you go. You found. You found it. But like, uh, on that note, let's see. I like. I like the fact that uh, type of. Can you see it now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So type of not a number is number. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Wow. Right? I have a funny video for that. Uh, my, uh, one of my friends gave a talk at Fluent Conf. And does everybody, has everybody seen Shrek? So he did type not a number, and then he played the Pinocchio. Well, I can't say that it is, but it isn't. But it, <laughs> it's pretty funny. Okay, so uh, that provides a better, the NG show makes it really easy to show and hide elements, and it provides a better user experience because uh, previously we had, you know, that template there with blank numbers. Uh, those were blank, now it's zeros. Uh, it just provides a better user experience of not seeing it until actually something's there, right? So ng show, and then there's the opposite, ng hide. So you hide it when the value is true. Um, I'm sorry. Um, like adding a delay. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. If you use, if you use uh, an iPad. It, there's a delay <laughs> of 300 milliseconds, right? If you're using an iPad, there's a 300 millisecond delay, I think. Um, okay, so another directive is um, ng class. So ng class is like uh, a favorite of mine. You can basically pass in an object uh, with class names. So I have the C CSS up at the top, and I have a class of bold, a class of I I have italic, and uh, I forgot underline in here in the example code for some reason. But those are my class names. And um, I'm passing a, a, a blue lean next to it, right? Um, as you can see in the controller, I defaulted them all to false. And then I applied them to these checkboxes. So I can flick a checkbox and set this sample text to bold. And uh, Angular does all that for you. It watches the isBold variable. And when, you, when that becomes true, it puts the bold class on the sample text. It's really slick. Uh, so bold, italic, and underline isn't very sexy. But you can do stuff with like background colors and uh, like a full class that has all kinds of other stuff. So you like uh, click a button and, it, and you can make a, a whole div transition to the other side or uh, flip a switch or all kinds of other stuff. But as soon as this becomes true, it adds the class uh, instantly, right? And we can take a look at that. The screen is uh, not very friendly. So let's see, where's the sample text? That's, that's not where it's at. Come on. All right, it's not being very friendly here. I've done this before, trust me. Where's the slide that I'm on? Here we go. For some reason, it didn't want it. 
I had to hunt it. I have to hunt it down. Oops. Come on the next slide. Uh, okay, here we go. So you can see uh, class is empty uh, right now. And as soon as I check bold, class gets the bold, it gets the italic, it gets the underline. So the ng class directive uh, binds or watches those Boolean options and applies the class to it. So that's, that makes it uh, very easy to add like an air class to an input box if like an error happens or, or stuff like that. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's all the uh, slides I have. I'm sorry? Yeah, the, one, the whole commented out block, yeah. Uh, GitHub have a list of the slides? I'm sorry? What does GitHub contain? Uh, GitHub just has like all the projects that I've worked on. Um, like there's a magic card game and uh, some other like weird stuff. <laughs> yeah, so these slides are actually on, I don't know if you can see that. Nope, you can't see that. Um, I'll write it right here, actually. So it makes, so it's up there. ngguide.com slash uh, angular js talk. It's all lowercase, but it doesn't matter. I tried to write all lowercase. It was hard for me. I usually write in all uppercase. So there's that. Um, the, the, the canvas puzzle thing is on howtohtml5.com slash puzzle, if you want to check, take a look at that code, too. Um, Uh, it's the Google I.O. slides from 2012 or 2013. Yeah, so that's, these are the Google I.O. ones. Uh, I work on a project called GDGX. Like, we play on the Google X, right? We don't build self-driving cars or anything. We just build slide decks. Um, but we rebranded it, and that's, uh, we called it, I think, Project Glider. So if you go to github.com slash... GDGX, these slides are up there as well. And then this is all HTML5, so you can just go to that, view source, and you have all the code, and then you could like go to this last slide and replace it with all your information and give the same talk if you want. <laughs> so Angular 1.3 uh, supports IE8. 2.0 will drop support for IE8. Google Apps has dropped support for IE8. A lot of people are dropping support for IE8. Yeah. Um, what, uh, so I only build for Chrome, and like I don't test in any other browser, I don't really care. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but that, these are like little projects or whatever. It's not like, like I'm sure, so I'm lucky I work internally and I can say, hey, use Chrome or whatever. Right. I can't do that on like eBay.com or something, right? Yeah. That's kind of like my yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so one of my recommendations, one of one of my recommendations, recommendations, and something that I've saw I've seen is uh, you you put up a huge modal that says this site could be so much better if you were using a better browser, or something like that. Like, provide a fun experience to make them switch or something like that. Like this. So. Uh, yeah. Um, so there was an HTML5 game site, and uh, basically they replaced the game with a static image saying you could be playing right now, but your browser doesn't work or something like that. Yeah. So you don't have to totally like let them out or whatever, but say, hey, it could be so much better. You just don't know. Yeah, so it just depends on your situation. So like if you're working for Bank of America and you don't have that option, then I'm sorry, you don't get to play with Angular, but. <laughs> so who in here is like a web developer? So you all know 
about like the complications yeah. with cross browser compatibility, right? So as far as I know, Angular 1.3 and under and and the whole 1.x series will support IE8 still. So uh, and when you switch to 2.0, it's going to be such a drastic change. You're probably going to have to rewrite a lot of stuff, anyways. So you can stay in one point, the 1.3 series and still have IE8 support. 2.0 is going to have tons of new features that old browsers don't support. So that's why they dropped the support and said, instead of us, instead of us holding back because of this, let's let's basically throw up the thing like, hey, uh, you know. You could be using Angular 2.0, but you care about your users, so use 1.3. <laughs> so it's kind of one of those things. Like if you want to build, so like if you want to build fun stuff, then on your on the side, then you get to use the fun stuff, right? But if you're trapped, then obviously you can't. Uh, I haven't uh, used PhoneGap enough to know. There's uh, a framework out there called Ionic that is built with Angular in mind. And it, it uh, I don't know if it uses PhoneGap, but I know it uses Cordova. Right. And it builds, you can build it into the packaged hybrid app. Okay, I'll look at that. Yeah. Um, so Ionic, and they're supposed to release a new one with the new material design. So oh, there's that. Any other questions? Yeah, I think they no longer support that, yeah. I know some companies just kind of like, like manage it themselves or sell somehow. Yeah, so uh, Chrome Frame was basically using Chrome's rendering engine and V8 inside of IE8, or IE7, 6, I think even maybe 5.5. It exists, but I don't. they stopped support on it, I guess. Um, so I don't know, uh, I haven't read a lot of the stuff on 2.0, I just know, uh, so um, I have a friend, Aaron Frost, he's a GDE, uh, like a Google developer expert on Angular, and I know he made a post and had some discussion with uh, Brad Green about the 2.0, and it is like a major shift. Um, from what I read, it's like, you basically have to rewrite to go to 2.0, but it's, but it's, it's, yeah, there's all these other features, and I'm not sure if it's worth it. It depends on how, how large your code base is, right? If it's, uh, if it's openwebcamp.com, or it's only like five pages or whatever, it's not that hard to rewrite. But if it's, yeah, if you have a huge stack, then yeah. Uh, I'm not sure on that number, but I know um, you see Angular being used a lot more places. And if everybody used the CDN, then they would have it cached. Uh, like Costco.com is using Angular now. Um, uh, what did they? What did I see the other day? There's a bunch of websites using Angular now. So like Costco's Photo Center, when you when you upload photos to Costco and all your images are laid out, that's an ng repeat of all your photos. I, like, I looked at the source, why it was loading so slow. <laughs> and I discovered that it was like AngularJS. So that's cool. Yeah. Well, not for Angular, for Costco's developers. It, it like, they have a, they have a custom, they, have, they made a custom like photo load directive that, so it iterates over that and then it like fetches the photos very slow. Mm -hmm. assuming because you need it, that you can have multiple controllers. Yeah, so you can have unlimited controllers in your app. Would you just then, is there like an ng-controller that identifies which controller? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, oh, it's Aaron's birthday too. <laughs> Let's see. Um, where was it? I think I don't have the actual, I don't have the other code. So, um, so first you create a module, right? App.module, the name of your, 
the name of your module. And then you can just, uh, so somewhere in the code, I set uh, var app equals angular.module, probably angular.js talk or something, right? So now app is a reference to my module. So app.controller this. I can do another app.controller that. So these are actually, yeah, so they're just, they just happen to be all named my controller. And actually in the code, it, it's prob so that's probably a lie. Probably in the, in the script. Uh, all, my, all my controllers are named something different for each slide. So I have the two-way data binding slide and the dependency injection slide and the model view controller slide. So I just, um, so there's the, the creation of the module with uh, no, dep no dependencies and I reference talk as it. So then I just do add another controller to the talk module, add another controller to the talk module, stuff like that. Yeah, so this, uh, this doesn't use like routing or views um, or anything like that. So the straight HTML just has, uh, let's see, it just tells oh, oh, use, okay. use this controller for this slide, right? right. Okay. And you can, and so basically, so the slide that had ng app, Angular lives here, right? You do the same thing with ng controller. This controller manages this scope. And you can have nested controllers as well. Oh, cool. yeah. So you could have controller A, uh, controller B inside of controller A, and then inside controller B, you can go scope.parent to get to the parent's scope as well. So you yeah, do I'm stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's just JavaScript, right? So you could use it for anything that you would build in JavaScript. Uh, I've only used it for sites. I'm not like a game developer per se. Like that puzzle was like the extent of my game <laughs> development. A question, I'm not a recent coder. Which is opacity, you know, colon zero, you have uh -huh. a line through it? Is that a way that you? Uh, that's just the uh, Chrome DevTools uh, saying that this, uh, this style is on the element, but it's not being applied right now. So it got, it got wiped out by this one because of the important. So it's saying opacity doesn't work here because that's just part of the Chrome DevTools. Uh, th the most major pain point is documentation, but everybody says that. Like it's hard to know, unless you get into the source code and read the source code and know what uh, ng repeat is doing, uh, ng repeat's an easy one to figure out, right? Four in, whatever. Um, but some of the other ones, it's like, how the hell do I build a custom directive? Like, there's not really a good source on that and stuff. That's probably the biggest pain point. But it's just trial and error. And then best practices also. So it's a pretty new framework. It's been like two years now, and there's a couple books out there. But there's not a lot of best practices, like this is how you should do it. Um, I guess you can get that from Angular's examples, right? I think the AG, they don't even support the Angular seed project, so don't look at that one. Like, there's the original one. Uh, but like the Yeoman, um, if you're familiar with Yeoman, there's an Angular generator, and that, that's pretty good. So like, that's what I use now uh, to, to like kickstart an app really quickly. So like, it makes it super easy. So like, I can just start an app right now, like from nothing. Like, uh, let me go to a folder. Uh, let's see. Open webcam. Oops. Okay, uh, so if you've, uh, is anybody familiar with Yeoman? Okay, so if you use Yeoman 
and you download the Yo Angular generator, you can just type in Yo Angular and spell it right. And it prompts you with some questions. Do you want to include Bootstrap? Sure. Do you want to, or do you want to use SAS? Do you want to use Bootstrap? Do you want the SAS version of Bootstrap? It goes out to NPM, downloads all the dependencies. Uh, so Yoman is a suite of Yo, Bower, and Grunt. Um, it uses Bower for your dependency management, and it uses um, Grunt to run all the tasks. And you could, yeah, you could say that. You could say that. Well, I mean, this just makes it super fast, right? So all the tedious tasks of scaffolding out your app and like going doc type HTML, HTML, head, body, doing all that stuff. No, just an interesting data point because, you know, I see a bunch of tools and it's, I've, all, I've always wondered, are people actually using this tool? Yeah. Uh, it aired for some reason. Sometimes that's a false error, so we'll see. Yeah, NPM. It, it scaffolded out the app, so it created all those uh, directories and folders for me. So now we can go into WebStorm, create a new project from existing files, go out and find that. Folder and import it. I think that's what I want. Yep. So just by typing in yo angular, it scaffold out my entire app for me. I have views and controllers and an index page. I have an app.js that has built in uh, route, routing already. I have a main controller. All of that just by typing yo angular. And then I can type grunt serve. Uh, ah. Sometimes it doesn't work for some reason. Let's try, there we go. So I had to run npm install to get all the dependencies, but basically it built this app and uh, kicked up a Node.js server and this is the page that it built as your like starting point. Um, the nice thing is is that you can uh, it has a, a feature called Live Reload. So we can go into my views, my main view, and see that, let's see here. As you change stuff, this, make, this makes it real easy to be a developer, actually. Uh, you can change this to hello world and save it and then it auto-refreshes your UI. So it, there's a node process watching all your files. As they change, it tells the browser refresh. So it's pretty cool. I forgot how we got down this path. What we, yo. Okay, so this is, a, this is, an, <laughs> this is an example of uh, some best practices on how to like kind of architect or like structure your app, right? So you have a scripts folder with controllers. You have a views folder with all your views. In the index file, you are, sorry, app.js. You have a route provider. So um, uh, the route provider basically watches the URL, right? And it tells it when it's at the root, use view mains.html as my template and use main control as my controller. You can add a new one in, super easy. And change what it is. So now when I go to slash uh, open web camp, use that view, use that controller. Obviously they don't exist. Let's just play around real quick. So there's a view. Uh, let's copy this and create a new controller. And the 
that's all we need there. And then we have to also make sure that that gets put into our index folder here. Okay, so now if we route to Open Web Camp, you get that. So it took, it used that view and that controller to do your interface, basically. And that's how you can segment your app. Um, I don't know, um, I won't show you too much code, but you can see this is a project at, at uh, eBay. And you can see we have lots of controllers separated and lots of views separated. So it makes it real easy to um, manage the size of your app because now if I want to change one view, it's all in one HTML file. I don't have to search through 20,000 lines of code. Everything's segmented. Any other questions? Uh, so I don't know about that story specifically, uh, but I know AngularJS is uh, like no conflicts with other libraries. Um, so if they were trying to do something within the world of boot, Twitter Bootstrap, then they would have had to include jQuery and, and stuff like that. There is an Angular UI project that basically um, gets rid of all the Bootstrap jQuery dependencies and does the Bootstrap stuff in Angular. So there's a library for that um, that you can do. It's Angular UI. Um, but it works friendly with other JavaScript frameworks. There's, there's no conflicts that I know of. So Angular itself doesn't have Bootstrap in it, right? Bootstrap, if you're talking about the styling, right? That's, it's, that's the CSS framework. Uh, so you would have to include the Angular UI project. It doesn't have like Bootstrap's accordion or anything like that natively built in. You'd have to uh, go get the Angular UI source and inject it into your project as a dependency. So f default getting Angular, it has nothing with Bootstrap in it, right? Uh, you'd have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. I'd have to see what your project looks like to determine you probably don't need the bootstrap JavaScript if you're including Angular UI because that replaces all that functionality. And you would just have to use the new Angular UI directives instead of trying to do Josh, Java, uh, jQuery functions on elements. And so like for example, the accordion or um, uh, tooltip, right? So there's a tooltip with a jQuery thing. Blah, blah, blah. If you just add tooltip as an attribute in your code and you have the Angular UI, Angular handles all that. You don't need any other JavaScript functionality, stuff like that. So, I mean, you just have to hack at it, I guess, and play around and figure out what's, what works and what doesn't work. <laughs> but the, the Angular UI project is very good at taking all of the bootstrap JavaScript functionality and um, making it easy to use in Angular. Any other, is that it? All right, thank you.